Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to have you all here today. I know we had 300 people sign up for this event. And so we're very excited and very excited to be um, to be launching our smarts, our, our Metacog online. So, Caitlin, as you heard from Lindsay, thank you, Lindsay. Um, Caitlin and I will be talking about this, our new survey, Metacog Online. And it's a it's a survey that is designed to help you as teachers, and educators, psychologists to understand your students' strengths and challenges and to help by helping your students to understand their strengths and challenges. Um, I'm Lynn Meltz, I'm the present president and the co-founder of the Institutes for Learning and Development. I'll tell you a little bit about Research LD in one moment. And I'm excited that Caitlin Vandenberg, to introduce Caitlin Vandenberg, who you've heard, who is our, our research associate and an educational specialist at our institute, and who really helped lead a lot of the effort on the Met, on the Metacog, together with uh, Kip Davis and Michael Greshler, our SMARTS director. Um, so I want to also introduce two of our uh, two of our wonderful um, Metacong Online pilot teachers, Lois Auburn and Jason Alamani, who will be talking as part of this presentation uh, and telling you a little bit more about how they use Meta, they've used Metacog in their classrooms uh, um, over the past few months. So the work that we uh, have done on Metacog Online, Smarts, and all of the other um, programs that we've moved out are part of our re of Research LD. Research LD is a nonprofit organization in Lexington, Massachusetts, that I co-founded about 30 years ago. Um, and our mission is to help to empower students to succeed in school and in life with an emphasis on teaching, developing, teaching, and evaluating the efficacy of strategies, instruction, in particular executive function strategies. And through Research LD, we run conferences, we do a lot of professional development in schools, uh, which of course has been online the past year or so. Um, and um, we are involved, as I said, in research and development too, so that anything we work out to you, we move out to you, including Metacog is evidence-based. Our work is, if, for those of you who decide you're interested in learning more about, um, about the work that we'll talk about today um, and the foundational um, components, you can take a look at our, our 10 books, in particular, the three recent books on executive function. And we hope you'll take a look at our websites. Important one, <laughs> SMARTS, um, which is our executive function curriculum. So over the past 10 years or so, a lot of the work that we had done and published, we had requests from teachers and educators to, to basically make it easier for, the, for all of you to teach these executive function class strategies in your schools because um, everyone felt like all the teachers who, who contacted us said, these are wonderful strategies that we read in your books. Can't you just make it easier for us to create the curriculum? So we listened and we did that. And uh, we created an online, a number of online programs smart, called SMARTS. Um, there's an elementary curriculum and, an, and um, a secondary curriculum that actually college um, students are used as well. We use for college students as well. Um, and each of these uh, programs comprises over 30 lesson plans, PowerPoints, hundreds of strategy worksheets for you to use with your students and training videos. So they're comprehensive and they're um, adjustable so you can and flexible so you can decide to, to start on lesson 15 and then go back to lesson one and then lesson seven. It doesn't have to be done in order. You can make changes. You can make changes to the PowerPoints. Um, and as you'll see, it, the Metacog maps onto this, onto SMARTS. Um, so I just want to show you the the paradigm, the theoretical paradigm that frames all of our work in executive function, which is this model of a clogged funnel. There is so much information coming into the brain on a, every minute, every second, every second, every hour and every day for our students and for ourselves as adults. And unless all of us learn how to apply these executive function strategies so we can sift and sort and stop that funnel from getting clogged, then we get on overload and your students sit at the computer, at their computers, and can't, cre can't produce the written documents that they have ideas for, or they're stuck trying to study, or they're stuck trying to understand, to summarize what they're reading. And so what these strategies do is they help students to set goals, to organize and prioritize, to think flexibly, to remember access working memory, and to self-monitor and check. 
And so all of these strategies are critically important. Um, and so metacognition um, is, means that helping students to understand how they think and to ask these questions about themselves. How do I think? How do I learn? How do my strengths and weaknesses affect my learning? And what strategies work best for me? If you can teach your students to do this independently, beginning with applying the metacog online, then you have achieved a huge amount because what you're doing is you're empowering them to learn for life. And that obviously is your goal. You don't want them dependent on you or on their parents. You want them dependent on themselves. And in, do, in order to do so, they need to understand their learning profiles and need to understand what works for them as learners. So just to give you an example of the kinds of questions on these questionnaires, um, we ask themselves to rate themselves on a scale from one to five. There are 30 items in the Metacog. Um, and the kinds of questions are, I have trouble breaking down my homework into smaller manageable parts. Rate yourself from one to five scale. Um, when I'm learning something new, I connect to something I already know. Rate yourself. I have trouble organizing my thoughts before I write. On many days, I forget to hand in my homework. When we, uh, once students go through these questions, they begin to reflect and to think and to, and to begin to one, understand how and why they learn the way they do. Um, sorry, it seems like my computer is, is jumping <laughs> um, across slides. So I wanted to just show you this overview of the Metacog, which is a set of, a set of surveys, five surveys that, we, that I developed about 50, uh, in uh, 2004 and published. Um, so it was sort of really research-based. Um, we've used these extensively as we develop them, thousands of students, and they have strong reliability and validity. Um, and, this, and these questionnaires get at students' motivation and effort, their use of strategies, their understanding of what metacognitive awareness is. So the first questionnaire, the, the Stratus, the strategy survey, is the one that we have now moved online as Metacog, the first part of Metacog online. And our plan beginning, uh, continuing this year is to then move on to the me and the other questionnaires, which we'll gradually have online for you. Um, so I'm going to show you a little, um, I just need to flip over this slide. Um, I'm going to show you now very briefly what the profiles that students get from the Metacog online. Once they've completed the 30 questions in the Stratus, they get a summary of their executive function, strengths, and challenges. And so a student will get this. This is what the summary, the summary of their strengths will look like. Like my EF strength is cognitive flexibility. And then suggested ways you can build on your strengths, like find and use a word that is more than one meaning. Example, bark could mean a dog's bark, a tree bark, chocolate bark. Look at some riddles you can tell your friends or family, like I have no doors, I have keys, I have no rooms. You can enter, you can never leave. What am I? A keyboard. So that kind of idea. So kids have ideas, suggestions for fun things they can do to strengthen what actually is already a strength in this case, or what in the case of the challenges. So this student, um, uh, Dan, had problems with his challenges with self-monitoring and self-checking. So what comes up on the computer and their summary as well, suggested ways you can improve, put a post-it note by your desk with a reminder to read over your work before handing it in, something that I'm sure you often tell your students. Or before you leave for school in the morning, ask yourself if you, uh, if you have all the items you need, or when you log out of your computer, quickly check if you completed all your tasks. These are all strategies which we all benefit from, obviously. So there, there are so the strategies that we have um, that come up online for students are ones that they can apply to their daily lives, be it for work or for social activities or for um, for other, um, for for example, their sports or their um, gym. And then for you as the teachers or the psychologists or educa other educators in other settings, you're going to get a, a uh, you then get a summary of your students, your overall class or your overall group of students. Um, and in this class, say five of the students were strong in organizing and prioritizing. So that most of the students were, many of the students were strong in organizing and prioritizing. And their major weakness or challenge was goal setting. The student that I just showed you, she was one of the few students who had strengths in cognitive flexibility and whose weakness was in organizing and prioritizing. So you then have, a, and then you can also take a look at each of your students' strengths and weaknesses or challenges as we call them, prefer to call them. If you want to look at, say, Evan or Kathy, you can, 
you have a you have a printout. And then what's what we are very excited about is that we've then teamed and matched this with our smarts curriculum. So if you have a particular student, you know then what you can then get a hat print, you can then sort of check in and say, okay, these are the three strategies I should start teaching him. Or for your class, you can get your pro, the overall list of 10 strategies that you can teach over the course of the next you know, 10 weeks, 10 months, however you want to plan it out. And, but most importantly, prioritizing. So you know, okay, um, I want to start with prioritizing time for my students. The lessons in SMARTS that, teach, that I can use to teach my students how to prioritize time are the ones I'll start with. And when Caitlin takes you through the questionnaire in a few minutes, you'll see how this works. And we're going to show you what's really neat, what you're very excited about, is we're going to show you your profile as a group. So you can see how this works and it can understand how it works for your students. So the last part, I want to just tell you very briefly some pilot information that we have, really, which is really interesting. We want to do as part of two pilot studies, one in the spring and one in the fall. We had five schools, 13 teachers, and 150 students in the, in the spring. And now in the fall, we had um, 26 schools and 34 teachers and 1,000 students. And Lois and Jason are two of, the, um, of two of our amazing teachers who are part of this pilot study. And... Um, what they what what our teachers did was try out basically use our our metacog online system with their students and then um, respond to questions so that they could give us feedback about how their students responded and and I wanted to show you a few um, a few of the findings but just I'm just highlighting a few. Seventy nine percent of the students reported that they would use the smart strategies in the future. And we felt that that was really strong because, as we know, getting students to buy into something is sometimes challenging. And this was only after using the Metacog, this, you know, a 15 minute questionnaire system that they then said, wow, this, this is powerful. I'll use these strategies. Um, so. After reviewing their profile, students also reported one thing that they learned, like I can get smarter, said a sixth grader, or I need to work on my memory for assignments to help me get by and not miss assignments and to help me get be better grades. Or I would like to say thank you for helping me fix my challenges, said another sixth grader. Another eighth grader said, well, when I saw my EF prof, my executive function profile through the Metacog, I understood how I could make goals for the future and things I have to improve on. And finally, a 10th grader said, well, my, my Metacop profile told me that I have the capacity to revise and reform what I do to become a better learner. That was pretty sophisticated. So you can see that it helped kids to reflect on, okay, what am I good at? What are my challenges? What do I need to do for myself to make myself a better learner and to meet my goals? And so the last part of our pilot, our recent pilot that Caitlin has sort of led all of these components is uh, we started... Um, a smart student ambassador program. We selected students had to apply and we selected a very a small number of middle and high school students and asked them to respond to they were interviewed, they were in a group, they gave us feedback about the use of our about the items, about how we framed the items and what what these meant to them. And so I want to show you just two sets two slides about these before I hand over to Caitlin. So um, what does executive function mean to you? And these are very sophisticated. Think about yourselves right now. If I asked you right now, what does executive function mean to you? What would you say? Would your answers be as sophisticated? I don't know if mine would. So one student said strategies that can be used to make decisions, which is pretty, which is an excellent definition. Another one, executive function like a team works together to solve problems. A third student, executive function means goals that you set and ones that you don't even realize. You can use them in school, workplace, or even at home. And then a fourth student said, I associate executive function with organization. And what we find is that in schools, actually when we, when we sample uh, a lot of teachers, often people think of executive function as organization and really executive function is way broader. It's cognitive flexibility. It's all of these, all of these processes that I talked about self-monitoring and self-checking and memory. And these students got it, which was pretty sophisticated. And when we asked them for another, these are just a few of the questions. I'm just showing you a snapshot. What does cognitive flexibility mean to you? Students said, well, coming up with a different way to solve a problem. 
which is a very neat way of defining it, or ways to adjust to unexpected events. And a third student said, for me, cognitive flexibility means that I can adapt and I can accept changes in my life. I think that is very, very sophisticated. Um, and finally, cognitive flexibility means my, my mind can think in more than one way and figure out more than one way of, do, of doing something. So you can see the power of a very brief, this very brief survey to get kids to think about how they learn, to think about how they think, to think about what the strategies are that can change their lives and, and help them to improve and can really empower them to learn how to learn, not only for the classroom work that you're doing with them at this point in time, but as I said earlier, for life, because metacognition means empowering students to become better lifelong learners. So, I'm going to hand over to Caitlin for the most exciting part of this presentation, which is letting you complete the metacog, and, and then we'll we'll look at the overall summary of your of your uh, group. So over to you, Caitlin. Great. All right. Well, if you are still um, finishing up the survey, please continue to answer the last questions. But for now, we want to kind of show you some of the features that you can access as a teacher, so that you can. Um, you know, maximize your use of Metacog online with your students. So as you all see, you've received a profile when you submit the 30th question. And you can download this profile as a PDF by clicking the Generate PDF button. So as you can see on the, on the first page here, the student is presented with their EF strength, a definition, um, an explanation of where this might present in their life, tasks that are related to this area, and ways that they can build on their strengths. So these are suggested strategies that they can implement right away um, after reviewing their profile. And page three um, is a similar format to page two, but with the student's EF challenge. So it presents a definition, an explanation, tasks that are related to this area, and suggested ways that they can improve. So they can um, you know, review their profile and take away these next steps that they can use um, right away. The last page of the student profile is primarily for teachers, so it explains the interconnectedness of all the EF areas, and it um, has a list of suggested lessons for, for students based on their survey responses. So this is helpful if you are um, working one-on-one -on -one with students and you can personalize down to the individual student. But what we also offer is um, at the um, class level, uh, every, every teacher gets a class profile. So what I'm going to do um, here is show you from our Metacog Online Teacher Resources page. So when you become a Metacog Online user, you have these resources here. Um, you have a walk through our implementation guide. Um, you have all the information you need to administer the survey, facilitate student reflection, um, and to, to access your, your student's profile. So what I'll show you here is a summary of all of our surveys from today, our class profile. Um, so here you can see everyone who submitted, let me just reload, everyone who submitted their, um, what their survey here today is counted in this class profile. So as you can see, the first page offers our overall strengths as a class, a little a summary of the strengths and the challenges. So you can see it broken down by area and how many students fall across the EF areas and the same for challenges here. On the next page, you can see broken down by student, their strength and their challenge. And then you can click from here into each student's profile and see their individual profile. Then back to the, the, the class view here, if you scroll down to the last page of the profile, you see the recommended lessons. It's an aggregate of all the students' data from the survey. Um, that suggest the priority lessons from SMARTS that you can pull from to teach right away. Um, we also, you can, from within the student profile, um, you can see how students responded to each survey question, which is particularly helpful if you want to see over time if their strategy use has changed and or see um, areas where you can um, support students where they might need another strategy or might need more specific support. So Kate, can I interrupt for a moment? Sure. So just to clarify um, and to, to elaborate on what Caitlin was saying, just so it's clear, Caitlin was saying students, because in your classrooms it would be, but we're talking about yourselves right now. 
in terms of this is the profile that we have from you, this immediate profile. I just want to just want to sort of read it because it's so powerful that I want to add to what Caitlin was saying. Um, so 50 of you um, felt that self-monitoring and self-checking is a strength. So that is the highest. So, so for your group, um, for the people who completed this, isn't everyone in this room right now, for, all, for approximately 100 people, 50 of you are strong in self-monitoring and self-checking. And in terms of your overall, and then 22 of you are strong in organizing and prioritizing. The interesting thing is cognitive flexibility comes out the lowest. <laughs> so we definitely have to show you the, all the strategies we use to teach that. And then in challenges area, goal setting comes out as, um, as the, uh, hi the highest level of challenge. Um, which is very interesting. I think many of us right now with the pandemic have trouble setting goals. I think we all feel that it's shifting sands, right? We set a goal one day and we have to change it the next day because of the situation that we're dealing with. So it's, that makes perfect sense. And cognitive flexibility comes out um, sort of lowest, uh, interesting enough. So and 25 of you felt that working memory was a weakness, um, was a challenge. So that's for so think about yourselves right now in terms of, um, you know, where if you had to think about it just in the moment, what would you view as your strengths and weaknesses? Sometimes people do this, take the survey, and they say, "Wow, this is really interesting. I didn't sort of conceptualize myself that way, but it really makes sense." Um, and remember, once again, I just want to also emphasize: this is not a diagnostic survey. People say, "Oh my gosh." You know, I'm terrible. This is this. all sorts of implications. The survey is specifically um, developed for your students so that you can use it multiple times over the course of your of the year. And your goal is to help your students if they come out as having challenges in goal setting at the beginning of the year, that by the end of the year, hopefully they're stronger in that way, in that area, because they, you've taught them strategies and they've implemented them. Or if their weakness or if their challenges in cognitive flexibility, that you've taught specific um, strategies for teach for for helping them to think flexibly and to and to learn flexibly, and that they've applied those. So this is the power of this of this of the meta of MetaCog Online, and we hope that we hope to sort of you all as you think about the questions that you just uh, completed and relate those to these executive function areas. I'm sure you'll come up with all sorts of um, interesting ideas of your own as well. Sorry, Caitlin, back to you. No problem. Thank you so much. Yes, there was there was one other um, one other thing that we wanted to show is that if you're administering um, to, to multiple classes or you want to search for individual students, we have an easy way for for teachers to do that. So they can um, right here, they can search um, by name or by class. So if you have a lot of students that you're working with um, or you are um, administering to many classes, we have an easy way for you to find the profiles for your students in your classes. Um, and one last thing, we um, can't emphasize enough how important reflection is. Um, it's a huge piece of uh, post metacog is making sure students reflect on their profiles. And we offer a few ways, um, we offer some recommendations Beyond reviewing independently, students can complete um, our EF profile reflection sheets. We have two versions, a more structured version and an open-ended version. And we include some suggested guided discussion questions for small group or whole class discussion. So this is all available. Um, if you are a Metacog user, it's all available in your teacher resources page. So with that, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, and I wanted to pass it back to Lynn to, um, so we can introduce Jason and Lois. So thank you, Caitlin. And hopefully through the chat, you'll sort of, you can uh, tell us a little bit about your, any questions you have about the, about Medi about the MediCog online, any questions that, that the, taking this yourselves just raised or thoughts. And we will have 10 minutes, at two, about five to 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. And that's an opportunity to ask all your questions. Um, so I'd like to introduce our two, um, our two the next presenters, uh, Lois Auburn and Jason Alemany. And as I mentioned before, they were both uh, middle school teachers at the, in the Pittsfield public school system. They've been using our, both been using Metacog Online as part of our pilot team. And, and they, they've come up with so many amazing and interesting ideas. Both of them are actually 
um, were actually selected as fellows in our executive function and equity fellowship that we run. Um, so we've had an opportunity to uh, to, to uh, meet with them either on other occasions as well. And so I'm going to hand over to both of them to tell you a little bit about what they've done with their students. So who would like to go first? <laughs> Lois, please feel free, ladies first. Oh, see, I was going to say age before beauty, but you know, whatever. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, so Jason and I uh, were fortunate enough to actually uh, do the original pilot last spring. Um, and then we were able to then do it again this fall. Um, so it was great because we could kind of see just the growth of the survey itself. Um, I know that the question was asked about some of the districts and I can speak to ours. Um, you know, Pittsfield is, uh, it's Western Mass. It's one of the last exits on the pike as people know it. Uh, we're 35, 35 miles east of Albany, New York. Um, we're about 40 miles west of Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, we are extremely diverse. Um, we're both rural and urban. Um, and our residents um, span the, the socioeconomic uh, spectrum. Um, just a little bit about Pittsfield Public Schools. Um, there's about 5,000 students, K through 12. There are two high schools, two middle schools, and eight elementary schools. Um, all students receive free breakfast and lunch. Approximately 50% of the students live at or below the national, um, current national poverty level. Um, and about 22 to 24 percent of our students receive special ed services, which is slightly above the state rate of 20 percent. Um, so what I can speak to, um, so I'm a special ed teacher. I've been teaching in Pittsfield for the last seven years. Um, I've, I've been teaching longer than that, but in Pittsfield, I've been there for seven years. Um, I've taught middle school and of the seven years in middle school, the last three I have been fortunate enough to teach with Jason um, the SMARTS curriculum. Um, in my role as a special education teacher, I spend part of the day teaching the SMARTS curriculum. Um, we, Pittsfield rolled out um, and the idea that all sixth grade students should have this class. Um, and we typically between, it's a semester class, um, we typically end up seeing the majority of the sixth grade. There's a few that we, that kind of fall through the cracks. Um, I, the other part of my day, I'm testing students in special ed for their, uh, in prep for their evaluation team meetings. And I also do um, executive function services to a select few students who aren't necessarily my sixth graders. Um, we, given the fact that it's a semester class, we've taught the class five times now. We're almost at the end of our, our fifth time teaching it. Um, we are extremely, ex I can't speak for Jason, but I'm sure he can say we're extremely excited about the survey and its progress and how we can use it in our roles as a special education teachers. Um, I have used it, um, so I can speak to me. Um, I have brought, while it's not a diagnostic tool, um, I have brought it up in uh, meetings where it just kind of gives some anecdotal information to parents. Um, they like to know kind of where their kids are sitting. They kind of like to know, you know, what strengths and challenges their students have. Um, it's been interesting because, you know, Lynn noticed that when we did it as a group just now, that certain things were higher or lower than others. Um, what we have found is almost contradictory in some cases to what parents feel. Um, so parents might say, oh, his room is a mess and, you know, he, he can't, you know, do whatever. And we're like, well, you know, organization was actually one of his strengths, but working memory is something he can work on at home or, you know, in school and, and whatever. Um, so as a classroom teacher uh, teaching this curriculum, um, I love the fact that it gives me a roadmap as to where to go with my lessons. Um, you know, we, Jason and I meet weekly, um, and we never have enough time to cover everything that we would like to. Um, so that top 10 prioritized list at the end of the profile is extremely helpful because inevitably we, we're scrambling and it helps to kind of tell us what we need to do in terms of student need. 
Um, I love this year that it's a report form. I can see my entire class at a glance. I can also make, um, you know, it gives me the option to print out the individual copies. So I have it at the ready in a meeting. Um, this will be the first time that we repeat the survey at the end of the semester. Um, I'm extremely curious as to what the data will tell us in terms of um, the student strategy use between the data points. We had it in the within the first month of the semester, um, and we're going to be doing it again next week as we end our semester. Um, so I'm curious. Um, you know, most of the students that I serve, you know, they do the reflection piece after. Um, most of the students were able to see and agree with, you know, the, the challenge and the strength. There were some that didn't necessarily agree with that. Um, and when I talked to them individually, I asked if they kind of answered sometimes. And they said, yeah, I answered that for a lot of them. Or I sort of kind of whipped through the survey to try to get through it. So the students whose answers, whose um, strengths and challenges really gelled with them were students that really get, did take the time and, and spend the time and evaluate the questions. Um, so um, as somebody who evaluates students for IEP services, I have noticed an increased demand for students who need the executive function services. Um, I've had my individual kids that I service do this survey as well. Um, and it, it's been very helpful because it really does help me to know where exactly they stand so that I can help serve them better. So on that note, I will happily pass off to my counterpart across town. Take it away. Hi, my name is Jason Alimani. Um Lowe's counterpoint counterpart at the other middle school. Um, and it, it should be said that in each of the middle schools, uh, there are probably between 150 to 200 students in each of the grades. Uh, and Lois and I will be working with close to every sixth grader over the course of each school year. Uh, so we will, be, we will be working with a significant number of students in any given school year. Um, I too am a special ed teacher and have been with Pittsfield for, uh, well, since 2014. And, you know, as with Lois, we have been doing this kind of uh, what, uh, we're splitting our time between, um, doing smarts and doing other special education related, uh, tasks. However, last year I got to, I got the opportunity, um, to teach smarts five periods a day, five days a week. Uh, and I taught it through, um, fully remote and then hybrid and then fully in person. Um, I have actually adapted smarts to a wholly remote digital environment. When you go into the um, research ILD website and go to the curriculum, everything is in PDFs, although some of them are now writable. Uh, it's entirely possible in a very easy process to convert everything into uh, the G Suite. You can convert the slideshows into... Um, Google Slides, the PDFs into Google Docs, very, very easy to do. So it's very, very adaptable from that point of view as well. Um, as with Lois, I use this as um, more of an anecdotal assessment tool. The curriculum starts off with metacognition, which is self-awareness. A lot of students have absolutely no idea or no awareness of what their trends are, where they tend to struggle and where they tend to have more success. This survey really helps them to see, I use this in addition to uh, several other free online learning style surveys to kind of start off each semester with introducing the students to themselves to a certain extent. Um, oftentimes, <coughs> excuse me, this is the first time they're really taking a look at themselves like this. 
and the Metacog online Distratus really is, uh, it, it, it's a pretty confirming for a lot of kids. Um, they know where they struggle. They just don't think of it in those terms and they know what they're good at. Um, but again, this really brings it home to them. The other nice thing are all of the visuals, the pie charts. Um, those have a, a tremendous impact on the kids. Um, and on me too, actually, this is the first time that I took it today. Um, I'm planning as Lois is to give this again next week or have the kids take it because I want them to be able to take a look at their progress in terms of their self-understanding. I want them to be able to look at their new pro profile, compare it to their previous profile and say, yeah, I did get better at this. This is some of the stuff that we did. Um, what we do or what I try and do in addition to generating these profiles is to sit down with each one of my students individually to discuss this profile, to talk about what it is that we've done over the course of the semester and how the work that we have done has impacted where their areas of challenge were. Um, that's one of the things that actually is a challenge for me because of our class sizes. Um, I routinely have between 18 and 24 students in any given class grouping. And in a 50 minute period, it takes me a period of days to speak, to give five minutes to each student individually to discuss this profile. And five minutes is not enough time to do this justice. So that's. That's one goal that I'm setting for myself um, for the next semester is to try and figure out a better way to touch base with my kids with regard to this information. Um, I like doing this at the beginning of each semester because it helps me to get a sense of both where my students individually are and also where as a class um, we need to go first and where we need to end. I just looked at um, my fall class profile and one of the top things that we need to touch on is understanding time and prioritizing time. And I'm actually working on that with my kids right now. Um, that's a perfect place, I think, for us to end because time management is a challenge that most of us have. And sixth graders are no different than adults in that respect. Um, I would love to be able to figure out a way to continue this um, with my kids when they're seventh graders and when they're eighth graders. Um, I've heard and seen folks who use this on kind of an as needed basis. It's not my place to have an opinion about that, but I know for me, doing smarts every day, teaching it, immersing myself and my kids in it, um, tends to have really visible benefit for all of us. So if you haven't had any experience with smarts, uh, I would strongly suggest that you give it a try. Uh, for those of you who currently use it, I'd be very surprised to hear that you're dissatisfied with it. Um, I'm not a paid endorser, uh, and if by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, executive functioning, we use it every second of every minute of every day. Um, and I take as much out of this as I hope I give to my kids. Thanks so much, Lois and Jason. Um, and for that incredibly, for that extremely helpful information, because I think it gives our, our, our audiences sort of an opportunity to, to identify how you can, how this can be used in, in the classroom. And as we've been saying all along, it's a very flexible um, system that you can use in multiple ways, as you heard from both Jason and Lois. And it can be used multiple times through the school year, it can be used once through the school year, it can be used 
um, to help you identify what strategies you want to teach, executive function strategies you want to teach, and how you want to teach them, when you want to teach them. And you can also, as you heard, also use this. Um, I often suggest if you have parent parent meetings coming up and you're wondering how to summarize your students' profiles, if you give them medical, this is it is so great for discussion with parents because often they perceive their kids very differently. And so it's a great conversation. It's a great focus for discussion in a meaningful way so that they can then understand how to help their kids to um, make changes in, when they do their homework, when they're studying for tests. So, so we'd love to take your questions um, through the chat. I know a number of you have put already put questions in the chat. And um, uh, Caitlin, myself, Lois, and um, Jason will um, can answer your questions. Will answer your questions. So, uh, Caitlin, do you want to summarize the questions and present them, and then we'll try and answer them. Definitely. We'll and before, before we get into the Q&A, we would love it if you would all now turn on your cameras and ask your questions aloud if you feel comfortable. But please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube. So if you do not want to appear in the recording, we ask then that you keep your cameras turned off. Um, but we would love to see your faces and um, would love to have you ask questions aloud. So um, yes, so to get us started, there were a couple questions about um, if this if Medicog Online can be used for college kids, um, there were a couple of questions about that first. So to answer that, uh, yes. Um, well, actually we've been using, and this addresses, I'll, I'm gonna address, I've been looking at the questions in the chat, so I'm gonna try and address a number of the questions <laughs> within the same answer. So in terms of college students, which also relates to, um, one of the questions was about reliability. Um, as I mentioned, the initial questionnaires, which we had on paper and pencil, we, we um, I first published in 2004, and we've been uh, adjusting and changing and applying it to sort of different groups of students, sort of over the years, to try and to to um, first of all make the questionnaire briefer, so that it's very very practical for you as teachers to use in the classroom. Um, and we know that time is of the essence, and you and you don't have time to give to give questions that that take that take up a lot of time. Um, so so, but our data, all of our data in terms of reliability, is based on on uh, primarily uh, early uh, late elementary and middle and middle school students. We did not have a cohort of college students. For example, however, um, we've had many people use our, this, this questionnaire system with college students and find it extremely helpful. And the students themselves have found it helpful. We also have university professors who have used this, um, you know, with with their groups, cohorts of students, and have found it very uh, have have commented that it's extremely beneficial. So. The questionnaire has a lot of flexibility because it's not a diagnostic tool where you come out with a diagnosis for a student. You don't have to have the same level of um, reliability. But overall, in terms of the, um, we, we were, as you saw from that one slide, we were at 95% reliability for many of the questionnaires. Hope that addresses that question. Go ahead, Caitlin. Great. So I'm just looking looking at the list here, how would this be used for progress monitoring to track the effectiveness of the SMARTS curriculum for a student? And I know that that's a question um, others have had too, is kind of measuring growth over time with Medicog Online. Well, over the years, uh, we all of us work using SMARTS and using Medicog, we've used the Medicog pre-post uh, as an evaluation system. So we've given it to students at the beginning of the intervention and then at the end of the intervention to, to assess change. Um, once again, knowing that it's not, this is a process oriented system. So you sort of have to view it within that context. Um, the interesting thing from all of our studies, and you should be aware of this, and Lois and Jason would be very interested to see what your findings are with your students, is that you know, often when you give a questionnaire system over time, you want to see that the, the scores go up. But actually, 
what we found in all of our studies, some of them which are published, is that students in some areas, their scores actually go down in some areas. And um, we have looked at this in, in terms of, and this is a positive because students often overrate themselves. I'm sure you have seen this. Well, I say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm incredible at, you know, at tacit measure sort of being flexible. And in fact, they really aren't. And so what we've been looking for in all of our studies, we usually look at the consistency between students' result ratings and teacher ratings. And we've been looking for sort of those two to, more, to cohere where they're more similar and where students' self ratings become more re realistic, if you want to call it that. And we've sort of seen that over time in many of our studies. So that's your goal, really, is to see to what extent your students begin to recognize their true, their, their profiles of strengths and weaknesses, which are more realistic in terms of what you're seeing and their parents are seeing. There's one question here that I wanted to address, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, and this is Brittany's question uh, about engaging high school students. Um, Caitlin, can I share my screen real quick? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, this is um, from lesson 3.4, Purposeful Highlighting. I'm going to preface this by saying there is an awful lot of room within the curriculum to make adaptations and modifications that suit your needs and your students' needs. Um, and what I'm about to show you is an example of just that. Um, this is an exercise, yes, ideally in purposeful highlighting. But what I've turned this into is an exercise in cognitive flexibility 